Okay, well, every blessing to you all. Uh, this will be a pretty broad and diverse video. And uh, if you've ever seen my open air videos before, then uh, you may call these a type of a rant, a type of uh, an unscripted performance or an unscripted presentation. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time preparing for videos. I used to be a perfectionist before I was saved, when I was a musician, and I spent a lot of time um, in the studio, a lot of time with my musicians trying to learn different songs, trying to get them to sound as good as they possibly could get, which is completely normal and uh, would be kind of strange if you didn't put a lot of effort into your work, but uh, in the end you become a little obsessed with your uh, projects and sometimes it's best just to speak from the heart. So my camera is screwed to the tripod, hopefully uh, better than it was last time and uh, as I said, you know, sometimes just to do a video uh, in a kind of informal manner and uh, to get a good spot, good location. And one of the reasons why I do open air videos primarily is the light. I have done internal videos over the years and I'm either too near the camera, I'm too far back, I can't be heard, or it's a rather grainy, washed out picture. So I'd rather do a video in the open and at the same time show off some of God's handiwork, which you can all see behind me. Uh, and also it's good, it's good to get out, get some fresh air and kill a couple of birds with one stone. Uh, it's nearly spring, it's warmer than it has been for a while and uh, it was glorious this week and next week it looks even nicer so praise God for that it's always nice when it's warm it's always nice when the sun is out and uh, you look at some countries of the world like Alaska where they have uh, three or four hours of light a day during their winter months uh, or maybe it's the South Pole I don't know geography was never one of my strong points but uh, I'm just glad that it's uh, it's dry that it's warmer than it has been and that uh, next week looks nice spring is here spring is here indeed. Uh, I want to talk primarily I guess today about separation and that's going to be a feed into testimonies, a person's testimony. Uh, I've got a lot of stories to tell and I will say that they are all true stories. I remember a well-known uh, end times preacher, a great man of God he was, who had a lot of success in getting the gospel out, witnessing to people and making a difference and towards the end of this man's life he kind of let it slip accidentally I would say that some of his stories had come from storybooks now I'm sure his intentions were sincere were genuine but uh, I used to think watch some of his videos that he was actually speaking from experience and it turned out that he wasn't it turned out that he was literally going through uh, storybooks using these stories to get the gospel out. You don't really need to do that. The gospel is powerful in and of itself and yet we all love a good story so it's a fine line that you walk but uh, what I'm telling you today is true and I just want to say that from the outset. Uh, I remember talking to a brother in the Lord who was too young to fight in the Second World War and uh, he was telling me that some of the great preachers of the 30s and 40s had gone off to fight in the Second World War and they were saved men, great expositors of the Word of God, mighty men of God and he said the thing that these men all experienced when they came back from the war was that they had shredded their testimonies, they'd all done things, they'd all participated in things which they shouldn't have done. Now if you are a saved person, and I always say this as a quick footnote I guess because I'm not going to make the case for or against whether saved people should fight in the armed forces. My grandfather was a war hero. In fact, both my grandfathers fought in the last war. And my father's father was interrogating Nazis in Germany at the end of the Second World War. He spoke German fluently. Um, so, you know, we certainly respect what he did. But uh, even more... Uh, important I should say is that he died unsaved which is even worse but the point I want to make is he did fight for Queen and country as it later became but he was fighting uh, for King and country initially but uh, he wasn't a saved man but if you are a saved person and you are going to go and fight around the world 
then you need to keep in mind that the chances are, quite possibly anyway, that you could find yourself fighting and killing saved men. Now imagine that at the judgment seat, Brother A has killed Brother B, whether it's the First World War or the Second World War, and they both appear before the judgment seat. It's kind of messy really, isn't it? And uh, you, know, you come back from the war and you've got all these kills under your belt and you've killed saved people, potentially. That's awful. How do you live with yourself? How do you live with yourself? Now, we believe in defence, we believe in law and order, and uh, as I say, I'm not going to make the case for or against whether or not a saved person should go and fight in the armed forces. That's something which you have to answer for yourself and think of and pray on yourself. But I'm coming from a testimonial aspect. That's my uh, mandate for this video. So like I say, these guys came back from Germany, from Japan, and they were saved. They went out into the battle zone and they came back with lost testimonies, shredded testimonies. And it's very hard to recover from that. Very hard indeed. Uh, I was talking to another brother in the Lord who was telling me that he'd been invited uh, to go to his blood brother's wedding. And uh, he said to me that he wasn't going to go because his brother had been married before and the service was being held in an Anglican church, which if you're in America is the Episcopalian church, and I think a female vicar was going to do the service, so he wasn't going to go to the wedding on those two points alone, and I respect that. Now, again, he's coming from a testimonial point of view, he's also coming from a separational point of view. His brother, his blood brother, wasn't saved, isn't saved, he's marrying a woman who isn't saved, in an apostate church and he feels he has no business being there. No doubt he's witnessed to his brother and his future wife over the years I would imagine and they have rejected the gospel and therefore he feels he has no right, he has no business being at that kind of a service. I respect that, it's not easy. Uh, we have been invited over the years to First Communion uh, services in our own family and of course we haven't gone. And I can tell you that since those First Communion services have taken place, no fruit whatsoever has been witnessed in the life of these people that have had their First Communion. We've witnessed two of them, we've given them the Gospel, and they're not interested. They do services, they do uh, rituals, they do church every so often, normally Christmas and Easter, but uh, when you try and get the Gospel out to them, when you try and witness to them, they're not interested. And also remember this, in the UK, I don't know how it works overseas, but in the UK a priest or a vicar is paid to do a wedding and a funeral. And I believe that to do a wedding in the UK is about £300. That's what they take home, which isn't, which isn't bad. If you do two or three services a week, you've earned, what, £900? Pretty good money. And I believe it's tax-free, but uh, that's another subject for another day. So anyway, these guys, these uh, people I'm giving you uh, honest accounts of, had to weigh up their testimonies. How would it look going into a service where there are unsaved people being married or being buried, you could also say. I had the opportunity of witnessing to an old gentleman some time ago and he wasn't really listening, wasn't really interested in the gospel and he kept turning around and saying to me, well you're telling me to do this and you're telling me to do that but what about this guy over there? And he'd point at a particular chap who offered himself as a Christian and he said to me, this brother that you call a Christian drinks, smokes, gambles, lives like the world, curses like the world, mixes with the world and you're telling me that I've got to get saved, you're telling me that I've got to do this and I've got to do that and yes, I am telling you this, that you've got to do this and you've got to do that. That brother, that alleged Christian, that professing Christian has destroyed his testimony. He lives like the world, he behaves like the world and those in his own town, those in his own community, have completely written him off. They have laughed him to scorn. And that's the problem, that's the reality of having a testimony. Um, I remember talking to another chap on the streets who was giving out business cards for a well-known ministry in America. And this ministry is one of the better ones, I should say. And uh, I had a conversation with this chap. I was giving out tracts trying to get people saved and he was giving out business cards trying to promote this ministry. His heart was in the right place and I had a long conversation with this, uh, with this guy and I said to him, why not just give out tracks? Why do you want to give out business cards to promote a very wealthy and a very lucrative ministry? And he looked a bit uncomfortable when I asked him this 
and uh, it kind of reminds me actually of something my dad was telling me this week. He was listening to a well-known uh, radio presenter in America and he was saying that uh, you can now give your cars and your houses and your boats as donations to this ministry. <laughs> and uh, he meant it too, he wasn't joking, he meant it. And this is a, again a multi-million dollar ministry. The uh, radio presenter lives in a pretty big mansion and he would be seen by most evangelical Christians as a pretty straightforward talking uh, minister of the gospel but that was a kind of sickening comment comment that he made and I agree it was sickening completely, in, in, completely inappropriate get a job fund your own ministry buy your own airtime which is what we've done and then if people wish to come alongside you that's something else but don't do it full time don't expect hard-working Christians to give up their money to support you and your many children in your big house and your private cars and all that nonsense. It's not biblical. It's organised religion at its worst. But anyway, I was talking to this chap giving out business cards and I said to him that the ministry that he was promoting by and large wasn't too bad, by and large from what I knew. But nonetheless, he would be better to get out the gospel, uh, get out the word of God without having to push ministries. But we got talking, me and this chap, and it turned out that he liked uh, mixing with unsaved people and socialising with unsaved people. And from my understanding of scripture, the only two areas where you can uh, associate with the world would be your family and your workplace. You can't pick your family and you can't pick your workplace, within reason anyway, especially in the UK, which is a secular country now. But uh, he was happy to hang out with these unsaved people and go to the pub with these unsaved people. And I didn't think it was appropriate, really. And I told him how I operate, how I uh, witness to unsaved people. And I go to work, and I come home, talk to my family, and I come home, and I do this and I do that. In the way that I would do it, and have done it, and will continue to do it. I don't stand uh, looking down at these people. I don't come across as holier than thou. I live by example. but. Uh, I don't socialise with the world. We're not told, we're not allowed, we're not expected to socialise with the world. Like I say, family are one exception, and your workplace would be another exception. But once you finish your work for the day, you go home, and you spend time with the Lord. Or if you're a family person, spend time with your family. You don't go drinking, you don't go socialising with the world. You can witness to the world, of course. You can have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea with the world but you don't go out drinking with the world, you don't hang out with the world. And I think sometimes some of our Christian friends haven't always thought this through. To get saved is straightforward, you believe in the Lord. It's like this, that if I was to put money into your bank account, all you have to do is get up, go into town and withdraw the money. The, the uh, payment has been made, it's now down to you to go and receive it. That's straightforward enough. You can't boast about that, for by grace you were saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it was the gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. It's a free gift, God has given it to you. But to go on, to become a disciple is something else, to grow, to mature, that's a whole different kettle of fish. And I think sometimes people focus on the salvation part, that they believed in their heart, they confessed Christ as Lord, which is what saves you. The sinner's prayer doesn't save you, your baptism doesn't save you. Your confirmation didn't save you. Even speaking in tongues isn't a sign that you were saved. The Mormons speak in tongues, and they are certainly not saved. But uh, you are saved by your faith in Christ, and then you go on. You walk with the Lord. You have a close relationship with the Lord. It won't be perfect. You will stumble, and you will fall, and you will make mistakes. And we've all done that. I've done that. But you confess your sins, First John. And when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins to cleanse you of your sins and you walk on with the Lord. That's your fellowship restored, not your salvation. You don't confess your, your sins to get saved. You don't confess your sins to stay saved. You confess your sins to stay in fellowship with the Lord. just wanted to make that crystal clear, if I may. But uh, like I say, these people sometimes don't take the full counsel of God into consideration. Yes, they get saved and these people I'm telling you about are saved, but they don't understand that you need to go on, you need to walk close with the Lord, it's a fine line. Uh, I was talking to another chap who is involved with the evangelical wing of the Church of England, and there's a wing within a wing, a group within a group. I know it's organized religion, of course it is, 
but nonetheless he is a good man, he's a saved man and therefore I want to give you this account and he was trying to get people into his sect within the Church of England and away from the mainstream, the ecumenical wing and I said to him, in reality you're wasting your time because people are not going to be saved one moment by their faith in Christ and then go into the uh, ecumenical wing of the C of E. Even the evangelical wing of the C of E have problems. They have paid ministers. They uh, are sometimes, sometimes even ecumenical. But uh, this chap, this party, is a saved man, he's a good man. But, as I say, he's trying to get people under the umbrella of the Church of England. That will, again, shatter your testimony because you're taking good people, safe people, sometimes, and you are introducing them into a system, into organised religion. It's not a good thing, because once you do that, you are now responsible for that organisation. You are now expected to speak up and defend that organisation. We knew a family who were pretty political. This is long before I was saved. And uh, there was a particular chap who was on the left wing, of politics and he had a relative I think it was a sister-in-law on the right wing of politics both parties aren't saved I just said it from the outset but nonetheless very political and uh, these two would meet up regularly and they would drink and drink and drink until they both get drunk and they would start to fight and argue and bicker so on and so forth and the uh, chap that I'm thinking about would get up and storm out of his sister-in-law's house and walk home He'd walk home because he drunk too much and he couldn't drive. These two were family, okay, they were family, and yet they were fighting tooth and nail over unsaved politicians, over their political views. Let me tell you this, uh, most politicians in the UK get on pretty well. Uh, and the same is true of sportsmen. Most sportsmen get on pretty well. It's the followers, it's the supporters of these people that fight and bicker and sometimes separate, which is completely ludicrous. It's one thing to separate for your faith in the Lord, and that's what the Lord wants. He said, I come with a sword. I'll set family against family, brother against brother, daughter against mother-in-law, son against father-in-law, and he will. That's the cost of discipleship. But it's completely stupid. It's completely foolish to, to separate, to divide over politicians, over sportsmen. I used to work with a woman who was football mad, soccer mad, and uh, I remember teasing her, I guess. I wasn't saved, hadn't been out of school very long, and I wasn't a sports person, and I'm not a sports person to this day. And I remember teasing her about this team that she used to support. And uh, she got really upset, really upset, you know, over some of the comments that I made. Nothing heavy, nothing uh, obscene, just a little bit of light-hearted uh, humor. But uh, in the end, I had to back off because my uh, humour was slightly offensive to her. And I got on very well with this one. We, we became quite good friends uh, during our time working together. But the point I want to make is she was prepared to fight. She was prepared to separate with me over a sports team. And that's what it comes down to, really, that even Christians, we are expected to separate even with our family and friends. I've said this before, that when I got saved, one of the first things that I did was write and contact uh, former bandmates and workmates, and especially family. And I can tell you that those people left me, they departed from me, left, right and centre. And all I was doing was telling them that I was now saved, I was born again, and I was full of happiness, full of joy, and I was waiting for the Lord to return marvellous and they didn't want to hear it they were quick enough to leave me and yet why is it that so many Christians can't let go of the world they have to hang in there they have to party with the world they have to mix with the world I'll tell you this the world won't compromise with you but you will compromise with the world and that's true isn't it say people compromise all the time with the world but the world won't compromise with you. That's why you were told to separate. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Come out from among them. Let the dead bury their dead. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. You can still love people. You were told to love your enemies. 
God loves the world. So if he loves the world, we love the world. But loving the world doesn't mean you condone the world. It doesn't mean you mix with the world. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. You were told to stand back from the world. You were told to be a light, be a beacon to the world. All these people that I'm thinking about, all these men and women, good people, very good people. I know a woman who lived on a council estate in the UK and she had a mighty testimony and I was told by another sister in the Lord and I have no reason to doubt this that she had uh, people firing uh, at her house bullets even now I don't know if that's completely true it may have been plastic bullets it may have been uh, an air rifle I don't know but she stood up for the Lord she witnessed for the Lord and her neighbours hated it they despised her for it what an amazing woman what an amazing woman she stood for something she took a stand and uh, that was good but unfortunately for her she slightly tainted her testimony when she got involved with Calvinism when she got involved with reformed theology and uh, you know no one's going to be perfect we all make theological blunders we all wrongly divide and uh, I'm sure that I've made mistakes in the past, and I'm sure that I'll make mistakes in the future. But uh, I'll tell you something, this woman is something else, really. You know, she puts me to shame, really. And I think she puts a lot of us to shame, really. But uh, as I say, you need to be careful, people. You need to be very careful about your testimony. These good guys went off to fight in the war. And uh, they thought they were doing the right thing. And uh, they all came back with shredded testimonies. They all had hurt themselves. They'd all lost their light to some extent. Not their salvation. I believe once saved, always saved. And I'll, I'll die believing that. But uh, you can lose your testimony. You can harm your testimony. It's so easily done. And once it's done, it's very hard to get back. Very hard indeed. But uh, as I say, these people, and I think of this chap, this socialist fighting his uh, conservative sister-in-law, fought tooth and nail, they would almost scratch each other's eyes out really over politics, completely stupid really, and yet these people, these politicians are socialising, they are drinking, they are hanging out with one another, and it's the same with religion, as I said in my last video to you last week, even religious people, people that are in the Church of Rome or the Church of England, they can get quite catty with you, and they can post comments and they can say things which they really have no mandate doing and yet their priests and their vicars are the best of friends so these people are, are out of touch they are out of step with their own church this is the folly of it this is why you need to know the bible you need to read it you need to study it because if you're not careful all you are doing is offering your own views your own thoughts on any number of subjects which is completely worthless it's groundless if you haven't got the Word of God to substantiate what you are saying. Okay, so I think I pretty much covered what I wanted to cover in this video. Your testimony, people, is sacred. It's very important. Uh, as is separation. And they really go hand in hand, I believe. Start simple. Start in a basic sort of way. Start in the Word of God. Start in prayer. And I believe that you know, if you're sincere, if you're genuine, these things will come to you. You will know that what I'm saying is so. Open the Bible, go through the Scriptures. Yes, you have liberty in the Lord. And I've said this also in other videos. We all have liberty in the Lord. To the pure, all things are pure. I don't care for double separation. And I've said this in other videos. I don't care for heavy shepherding. If a say person wants to go to the concert or the theatre or the cinema, they can do so. You know, I'm not going to clobber them over the head. I'm not going to judge them for that. If a saved person wants to serve his or her country, that's up to you. That's completely up to you. you know, I'm not going to say you should or shouldn't do it. All I'm doing is pointing out how your testimony will be seen as a result of that. Same is true You know, people who go into pubs or uh, saloons. You know, you think, how does that come across? How is it seen? This chap that I was witnessing to, this old boy, 
was so quick to say, never mind you telling me that I've got to get saved. What about this chap over there? This guy you say is a Christian man. He drinks, he smokes, he gambles. What can you say? He's hurting himself, and he's also undermining my attempt to get the gospel out. And if he is saved, question mark, then he'll have to give an account of himself at the judgment seat, as will the saved soldiers from World War II that came back and had found themselves doing some awful things during the war. As I say, Brother A killed Brother B, and that goes to the judgment seat. How's it going to work? They're still saved. But you get my point, don't you? This is why you have to think these things through. Fighting over politicians, fighting over sportsmen, fighting over religion, stupid. It's complete folly. Make sure you are saved, and then once you are saved, take a stand. I tell you this, it would be far more beneficial in eternity for you to separate from unsaved family and friends over the Lord Jesus Christ than it would be for an unsaved person to fight and fall out with a, with a with another party with somebody else over a politician or a religious denomination or a sports person complete uh, nonsense really but uh, just guard your testimony guard your testimony think what you do think before you do what you're going to do and if you're still not sure pray about it seek counsel get godly counsel but uh, above all just make sure that what you are doing is Christ-centered as I say you have liberty in the Lord and I will always say that I'll always defend that and I teach that myself and I practice that myself but the moment my liberty causes somebody to stumble the moment my liberty puts my own testimony into question then I have to seriously reevaluate what I'm doing and uh, as I say, these people had to weigh up the pros and the cons. The brother who had been invited to his blood brother's wedding had to weigh up the pros and cons of going to that service, and he chose not to go. And I will say this also, that I do believe that you can remarry. There are grounds for remarriage, infidelity, desertion and death, and um, maybe uh, I'll re visit that subject on a future video I've done videos already on that in the past but uh, he had the ability to go if he wanted to go to the wedding but he chose not to go and again I do salute him for that and I wrote an article just a couple of years ago on a brother that we worked with who went to the graveside of a sibling who had died and he had to weigh it up whether or not to go and it was quite a painful time for him he was saved, of course, but his sibling wasn't saved, and his family weren't saved, and they were not interested in the things of the gospel. And uh, this funeral took place in an Anglican church, again, Episcopalian, if you're in America, and he thought, should I go, shouldn't I go? And I wanted to let him make his own mind up, and eventually he decided not to go to the service, but to go to the crematorium. In fact, it was a burial, I should say. And he... Uh, stood around the uh, burial site with his unsaved family and was able to give tracts out. He won't get that chance again. You won't get all those people together again in one place. And he witnessed to them, gave them tracts, and he quietly withdrew himself as they all went off to the, to the nearest wake, the nearest pub for drinks. He had done what he had to do, and I respect him for that. It's not easy to do, and he got criticism for that. And... Uh, that's the way that it goes. You can't please everybody. Someone said, let every man be true to himself. He took the position that it would be best not to go to the service, not to sit with unsaved people, not to sit with a vicar, a female vicar, doing the funeral service. He knew he had no business being there. He'd already witnessed to his family in the years gone by, and they weren't interested. But they wanted a service for insurance. Uh, yes, insurance, and that's what they do, isn't it? Quote, unquote. <laughs> For insurance just in case just in case just in case there's a God just in case there's an afterlife and these foolish people have these services it's like Catholics that are dying and they start to panic get the priest get the priest quick and the priest arrives at the bedside of the dying Catholic and I've seen it in my own family and these priests don't even know these Catholics that are dying 
and they start to pray over them, give them the last rites, and the family take a great sigh of relief. We're so glad that Father such and such got to the bedside of whoever it was that's dying and got there just in time. It won't save you, of course, but for Catholics, it's that bit of insurance, just in case. Now, I'm not talking about uh, committed Catholics. I'm talking about your typical uh, lapsed Catholic, your typical once a year or once every other year or once every 10 years that they go to church. It's those Catholics that are scared, that panic on their deathbed. The, relig uh, the regular Catholic, the religious Catholic, will go to Mass regularly and have a lot of religion, a lot of head knowledge, but for the most part their hearts are dead. They're not born again, they're not regenerated, and they have this false notion that as long as they go to confession, as long as they go to receive the Eucharist, as long as the priest gets to them in time, they'll be okay. It won't save you people. It won't save you. But again, until you are born again, until you understand the scriptures, why would you know any better? You wouldn't. But uh, anyway, that's another area for the follies, <coughs> excuse me, of organised religion and the dangers of organised religion. The, the complete nonsensical uh, area of following what men say, following what women say, following the sheep. You will die alone and you'll be judged alone. Never mind being in a church of one, two billion people with your Catholic or Islamic that's not going to help you people. You'll die alone, you'll be judged alone. You came into the world alone, you'll go out alone. But uh, your testimony is so important. I'll just close with this final point. Let's say you came from an Islamic family and you get saved. 10, 15, 20 years down the line, there's a funeral that takes place. Would you go to the or mosque with your family? Let's say you were a Freemason for many years, 10, 15, 20 years, there's a death in the family. Would you go to the funeral? Let me know what you think.